to the Mike Grossart Show. We're live again for another weekly installment. And today I'm live from our newest cottage, which is more like a, a lodge than a cottage. But check this out. Look at that view of the lake. Can you see that? 365 views of the lake. Give you guys a little tour. You guys can see that. Epic. All lake. Like 270 degree views of the lake from all the levels. We got 25 to 35 foot ceilings. The whole thing is made of handcrafted beams. They're like eight by eight, 14 by 14. Just a beautiful, beautiful uh, little cottage here. Just unreal views of the lake there, just as far as you can see. The lighting's not really ideal, but gives you guys a little idea there. Just super, super sweet. So, yeah, I've been doing a little beta testing here. This one's a five bedroom cottage here with an acre on the lake, private ownership. And uh, we've been testing it. I've got uh, six cottages now. And we've been testing, look at those, that vault. This one was built in 2003, as you can see, but it needs some updating for sure. So, it's got quite a lift on it, a lot of potential. I'll sit this down here for a sec. But yeah, I love that every room has these uh, these exposed beams everywhere. That's all like 10 by 10 uh, post. So it's a beam and post construction, which is super cool. Uh, they actually bring in, these were the story of this property where they were brought in from uh, British Columbia here. So actual trees and then hand uh, scraped on site. So they're full trees, 30 feet high, supporting the whole structure all the way around, which is pretty cool. Um, they're like literally in every room everywhere. And uh, even in the, the master bedroom and the upstairs master that has a walkout um, second story deck and stuff that, that walks down, even all those rooms, they've got these beautiful uh, you know, cedar ceilings and it's super cool. So we, uh, we love this one. We're going we're gonna to be trying out a few things. So I want to talk a bit today about house hacking and rent hacking because it's come up several times now. It's a, it's a frequently asked question. It's like uh, people start when they say, hey, well, how do I start getting ahead? Like, I understand this equation that like, I have to make a lot more than I, than I spend. So like, how do I bring my spending down if I'm at a job making 70 grand a year? What do I do? And it's like, well, it's hard for me to teach you how to go to your boss. And even if I could teach you, it would take a, it takes a long time to build the skills. Like no one goes from 70 grand a year to 700 grand a year in a year. Like you can learn the basics of entrepreneurship. You can pick up a side hustle. I personally am a low... I say I'm low risk, but then I go on a short. But uh, I, I did t before and to my core believe that the best way to unlock financial independence is to do it the way that you can have a 100% chance of success. And 100% chance of success with financial independence is saving your way there and investing that, investing it astutely and then having that grow. Once you've got your stable base, your FU money built up, then you can take risks. Then you can go quit your job and go into this business all in. Then you can take, you can short, you can do things that are, you know, more advanced levels of, of risk. And that's how you make your way to decamillionaire and centimillionaire and billionaire is by taking those big risks, right? The big risks calculated lead to big results. Everyone I know who's ultra rich got there by taking enormous risk, but what I wouldn't recommend is someone who's making 50 grand a year to quit their and has two kids to quit their job and start Airbnb arbitrage or start a uh, Amazon arbitrage or start a FB, you know, marketing type business or jump into some new latest and greatest craze. Like right now, everything's arbitrage. So like Amazon arbitrage, you know, marketing arbitrage, uh, you know, social media arbitrage, Airbnb arbitrage, uh, flipping arbitrage, which is like, again, all these crazy arbitrage techniques that... 90% of people fail at, right? Like if you go through, well, we have really good data for Airbnb, so I'll use that as an example. Airbnb is suffering right now. And almost every guru, if you go into their actual listings, aren't that profitable. Their gross numbers are super sexy, like, you know, $100,000 a month or whatever. And you see all these new people. There's a new person every day on social media that I see that I have no idea who they are. And they're like, I'm making $100,000 a month on Airbnb. And it's like, you can go look up their stuff and, and they're not. They don't have five-star reviews and their calendar is empty a lot. And so it's interesting to see that, that, and by the way, 100,000 net is potentially zero net net, right? Like they're saying, we're making 100,000 clear from Airbnb. And it's like, well, then they have rent they have to pay. Then they have furniture depreciation expense and they have unit turnover expense and cleaning expense and management fees and salaries and 
all the other things like sales tax, it's 13% of all revenue collected. And when you run the numbers, it's like management takes 20%, cleaners take 20, 25%. There's 45% of revenue gone right there. Then you've got rent, which is now a third. So you got 70% of their number they're telling you they're collecting is gone already to expenses. Then you've got furniture depreciation. You've got damages, you've got unit turnovers that happen every two, three years. We got to repaint the unit and clean it up. That's on you. Um, you've got all these things that pop up. Like it's just, you got sales tax, 13%. The best operators in the whole space net 10 to 20% net net. And that's including the allocation for their capital in their furniture. Because if you have an arbitrage business and you don't actually own the property, your capital is the labor to set it up and the furniture depreciation over time. There are people who run really cool businesses. I have friends who do a great job at this, but there are lots of people who are not my friends who I see claiming big numbers and like, oh, I'm making a million dollars a year on Airbnb. And it's like, well, they are collecting a million dollars on Airbnb, but they're netting $50,000 or $80,000. And it's like, that's a lot of risk for 50 or $80,000. If revenue were to drop 20%, they're underwater by 80,000. They've paid $80,000 a year. It's not a job. You're working and you're paying for the right to work. That's what entrepreneurship's about and it can happen. And when that happens, it sucks. And it's a lot of risk. So anyway, I just wanted to chat about that real quick. But um, yes, yeah, so the stable path to financial independence. I love the entrepreneur route. I think everyone should have a side hustle. I think we all have, if you're putting in a full-time hours, 40 hour a week, work week, you probably have 30 hours of hobby time that you're currently spending watching Netflix and scrolling on Instagram and whatever else. Like that time you could peel that out and you could put that towards, you know, buying properties or learning Airbnb arbitrage or some sort of, there's lots of businesses. I'm not saying that you can't get any one of these businesses, their margins aren't as juicy as some people may make them out to be. Even flipping. Like there's a lot of flippers I know that went through this recent recession we had and were losing on a lot of their flips. A lot of flippers in Ontario that were saying, hey, bought it for 400, sold it for 550, made so much money. And it's like, but their carrying costs were 100 and their renovation was 100 and whatever else popped up. And it's like they actually lost money in a lot of these situations. So the, that's the, the reality of when you have a declining market. Now, in a bull market where prices are just ripping up, which is typically what we've seen in real estate the last two decades, it's hard to lose, right? Like it's you just make money hand over fist holding anything uh, real estate related with leverage applied, right? Unless you really, really have terrible employees or you know terrible contractors or terrible managers. For the most part, it's hard to lose money in a bull market. So... Um, yeah, I think those are the great ways to slowly build wealth, the sure way. Once you've got your footing, once you've got your, you know, your your fortress of solitude money, that's when you can take a bit more risk. For when you're just getting started in this, rent hacking and house hacking. So that's what I want to talk about in this, this stream today was rent hacking and house hacking. And of course, if you have any questions, put them down below. I'll happy to happily answer them. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where like 50%, 40% of what most people spend goes to housing. And so, and I'm going to talk about resort hacking too, because it's, it's the next level, I think, for the ultra um, fire, the Lux fire. It's, it's the next level when you have some assets and you have some wealth. It's a cool way to life hack, I think. So that's where I'm going with this, is I'm going to have resorts uh, all around the world in, in probably three or four countries, probably in Bahamas for tax purposes, as my primary residence, some in Florida, and again, some in the beautiful waters of Ontario. And I'm, I'm beta testing that now in two of those markets. So I'm collecting data, I'm testing things, I'm learning in both Florida and here in Ontario. I'm doing, like I've done Airbnbs in London, lots of them. I have no more Airbnbs in London. London actually outlawed Airbnb. So anyone who still has them in London is doing it illegally. And there's lots of people I know who do and like whatever, do your thing. But I have a bunch here on the water here, these cottages, like this one's more of a luxury product. This is a five bedroom, like on an acre on the lake. This will do like 500 to $1,000 a night. So. Uh, this property here, once I have it fixed up and, and done the way I want it and uh, everything is, you know, perfect and we've got the beach volleyball court in there, we got the, you know, the deck down to the beach, we got the hot tub and the swim spa all year round, we got the cedar barrel sauna going, we have all the, once we have all those amenities going, this will book super easily for, even for a Christmas, like, you know, you get a, you get a nice big Christmas tree there, you get everything going, like the high ceilings, people just love coming and getting away and this is 45 minutes away from London. Uh, it's a couple hours from Toronto. So you can, and it's another 30 minutes, it's not even 25 minutes from Sarnia. So you've got like all these vantage points where you can grab from these major po populations. There's lots of people there who have money who want to just get away and they need a big place to do that. So these cottages, strangely, in the summer can do, in some cases, more than $1,000 a night. Some cases, if it's done really, really well, $1,500 a night. So that's interesting because that's $45,000 a month on a property that's a million three. 
so that the math can work. Um, I have other cottages that are like five, six, seven hundred thousand. Those can do five hundred dollars a night too, and the math really does make a lot of sense on those. Um, but a resort, I'm, I'm beta testing the different levels. So I have like five hundred thousand range, seven fifty a million, and this is more like the million and a half product, um, where I think there's there's really going to be some some cool beta testing I can do with data to find out what works and what doesn't, what amenities add certain amounts of, of revenue, what kind of guest profile we're seeing. And then we we basically basically take that data and reverse engineer it and say, hey, okay, so this is the type of client. Once you understand your market, then you can build your properties to suit. So you can renovate a certain way. Like this has horrible paint colors as an example right now, horrible furniture. I was able to negotiate all the furniture in, but um, no offense, obviously the furniture, I know they, they did a pretty good job. Like in these couches are not bad and like the chairs are not terrible, but it's just not, can see it's just not really tastefully decorated uh that that coffee table is actually a big trunk of a tree it's a three foot wide tree and the thing is super thick that could be restained and, and could be salvaged and it'd be beautiful but um but yeah there's definitely some some upgrades i would make cosmetically and the paint colors and the the floors and, and those sorts of things go a long way and the amenities go a long way too like hot tubs saunas that keeps it booked year round especially in this area it's interesting some of the listings have like go 90% vacant during this time. So it's like, hmm, what do you have to do to keep your, you know, your resort property booked in the off season when many are, are vacant? And there are a select few listings that have hot tubs and barrel saunas. They spend $50,000 on amenities and that keeps them booked all year round. And they get that return 100% ROI every year just in the off season, keeping their, their things booked. People come out for hockey tournaments. They come out for Christmas. They come for winter get to, you know getaways. They come to to ski or they come to cross country ski or to go snowmobiling or whatever, just to get away. And they say, you want to winter, winter escape. Winter gets tough and coming out to something like this is the, you know, it's an amazing opportunity to decompress and it's local and it's close and you're 45 minutes from home, boom, done. What's a, a couple thousand bucks for, for a week to get away or a weekend to get away it can make a lot of sense. So that's been something I've been interested in. And I really like it in Ontario because the landlord tenant board in Ontario is just like, so hard on landlords and they always side with the tenant and all of the rules are written so that the tenant has all the rights. And so I loved providing housing. I loved solving for that issue, but I'm not compensated for it. Tenants cannot pay for a year and get away with it. You can st the only thing you can steal in Canada legally is rent. You can steal housing from a private landlord, no big deal. But you go and steal my car for $5,000 out of my driveway, you go to jail. You go to the grocery store, you steal $1,000 in food, $500 in food, jail, criminal record. In Ontario, you steal $25,000 in rent, $2,000 a month for a year, and it's like, oh, no big deal. It's okay. No criminal record, no nothing. It's the one thing you can steal like, from private citizens, no problem. Like, you just steal that house. You steal their mortgage payments. You steal their utilities. Don't pay anything. Let the owner pay it all. We don't care. Um, the tenant destroys the house. No recourse, whatever. That's a lot of what's going on in Ontario. So that's what's driven me out of long-term rentals. I have, I will have none. I have one more, uh, a really cool house sack property, a, a triplex in London that's coming up for sale. It's got a, a guest house and a main house that's divided into two units. Um, so there's like uh, three, I guess, in total. Beautiful big backyard. Be a great house sack. Live in the back and then rent the front house two units to cover all your mortgage payments. You live for free. That's an example of house hacking. That's how you should be living. Find a property that has a guest house in the back you live in the guest house or you live in the main house and you rent the guest house out and that pays your mortgage. So you can live for free. That's a philosophy I've lived by for the last 12 years. And it's been a huge cornerstone of who and, and what I've been able to become is not having a housing expense. I've always found a way to get around that. And that's through having, initially it was having I rented and then I had roommates to split the rent. That's called rent hacking where you go rent again, GTA Toronto, you can rent a, a five bedroom house in the suburbs for like $3,000 a month. $3,500 a month. And you can rent those rooms out for $800 a month. So you can take the basement and rent the five rooms upstairs for $800 a month each. That's $4,000 a month. You're living for $500 a month profit. Your cost to stay in the basement is zero. Nothing. You're actually getting paid to, to carry the lease. And that's called rent arbitrage or, or rent hacking. People can do that right away, get their expenses down. And then house hacking is the evolution of that. Once you've set up some capital and you've, you've been rent hacking for a while, then you go buy a duplex or you buy a triplex. And then you put a guest house in the back too, so it becomes a fourplex or whatever. You add units effectively and you rent those extra units out that you're not using and you live in, say, a two or three bedroom for yourself. You can do it in a loot, in a, what's the way, they, like a luxury, bougie kind of way. And in a way that doesn't, you know, detract from your quality of life. 
So anyway, that's that's rent hacking and then house hacking. And resort hacking is sort of like, well, you go on vacation anyway. Why can't you find a way to... Like on vacation, people are having their best experiences. It's when people are their happiest. It's when they're living their best selves. Why couldn't I have that all the time? I'm like, that would be a cool life. And it's so like, that's an optimized life. Imagine if I had resorts in Canada and in Florida and in Bahamas and maybe one in Costa Rica too. And it's like the Bahamas, you've heard me talk at length about the Bahamas, Canada, Florida triangle. Or you're living in the Bahamas, that's your primary residence, you're tax-free, you operate your businesses out of the Bahamas, again, tax-free. Your businesses uh, in Canada and in the United States pay management fees and IP to license the IP of the websites and everything back to the Bahamas. So those corps can operate at tax neutral because again, they have no profit. All the profit goes back to the management companies and you hire the Bahamas companies and you can have friends that have Bahamas companies too and you hire them to do all the management and you can operate your businesses in Canada, in the United States and in Bahamas as well and have a, a really sweet tax setup and spend say five months a year beautiful here on the lakes of, of you know, Lake Huron are the most beautiful waters ever. In the summer, Bahamas waters come close to Lake Huron, Ontario uh, beaches, but not not quite as good. And uh, I'm gonna be personally biased, but just like on a clear blue day, there's just nothing better than this lake here, this freshwater lake that's beautiful and clean and just, like the ocean is dirty in comparison. Like you go to Florida, you smell the air. It's like, you go to the Bahamas, I mean, it's, it is clean, but the ocean is a different level, I think. Sorry, the sun's coming up crazy here, guys. One of the nice things about having windows is you get a lot of natural light and it's beautiful. Those like 25 ceilings over there, but um, they're not so great for streaming. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, resort hacking. So that's a big piece of it, right? It's just finding that, um, it's finding out what works. And anyway, one of the things I'm looking at right now is trying to find a 100 acre parcel, like a campground. If you guys know anything, by the way, from call it Goderidge to Bright's Grove, like Camp Lockheed, Blue Point, um, you know, into Port Franks even towards Grand Bend, ideally south of, or like more towards Sarnia from Port Franks, but between Point Franks and Camp Lockheed, let's say, anything there are campgrounds or um, some sort of property that's got multi seasonal allowances in the zoning, I would love a tiny house community on the lake. And there was one that I almost bought and it was like, I'm still actually in talks and in the budget of like $5 million, you can find some pretty cool stuff where you can put in 50 to 100 units. And I can imagine 100 tiny houses, that would be super cool. And peak season, if you put in like a swim spa on the lake, you had like, you know, um, kayaks and you had all the, the water toys and amenities, you had all the campground stuff where like you've got the fun stuff going on and the, the, and the drives people to come and want to stay. You can easily do them. If you bring in modern tiny houses, you bring them in for 40, 50 grand, pre-built, drop them down on the pads, uh, or even on, on wheels, you wheel them in. You bring a hundred of those in at like 40 grand a pop, they can rent for a hundred, two hundred dollars a night in the on season. And in the off season, you can still get well over a hundred dollars a night. That's three, four thousand dollars a month on a forty thousand dollar investment. And once you have the land, it's not that much more to add additional units to it. So if I can find the right parcel, I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna sell my house, I'm gonna buy that as as my Canadian uh, resort, where I may set up shop um, in the times that I'm in Canada in the long term. But um, for the something interesting is is uh, you guys know I lost like over a million dollars shorting the Nasdaq, and we'll see how that plays out. I may have to cut that short. I'm not going to be irrational here and say that like I have to be right because as a short position bear, I will eventually be wrong. Like bears always lose long term. So the key when you're a bear is to make sure that you're focused on when to cut. And I don't think it's yet. I, I, I honestly don't think the time cut is yet. I think we're going to be further down, a little bit more pain to come. But we've had the strongest year to date. The NASDAQ is the strongest year to date in 50 years. So of all the times I could have shorted in the last 50 years, from start of the year to now, in, in any of the last 50 years, this is the worst. So that's really unlucky, really unlucky. Let's talk about like people say, hey, Mike, you're so lucky. You're so lucky, this and that. It's like, not really. Um, in real estate, I started in 2012. There was zero appreciation. London actually lost to inflation. It underperformed Canadian real estate compared to the rest of Canada. It underperformed against inflation for a six year period. I made a million and a half dollars. So that's, that's a testament to me that like, if I can make money in a down market that, and I can make money when I'm unlucky, I know that, like I tell myself, like, I know that that means that I have something special and that I, I can use that to make 
you know, future gains. I just need to be smarter about it. And I need to make sure I cont continue to contain that risk, right? Like a lot of people would say, hey, double down your short, Mike. No, 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 no. Like the short is isolated. I've risked a certain amount of my net worth. I'm not comfortable risking more than that. Keep your money in several buckets. Like I have a bucket for private lending. I have a bucket for real estate projects. I have a bucket for stocks. I have a bucket for shorting. And I think it's important, and I have a bucket for crypto and a bucket for several other asset classes. And I think it's important to watch your different asset classes and to, I'm oh, sorry, I'm gonna go over guys, the sun's killing you. Ugh. Let's try it. Whoop, sorry. Okay, is that better? Maybe, a little bit? I don't know, that might be worse. Better, worse? At least the sun's not coming in at you guys. Okay, I'm gonna go to the Q&A for a sec here and then we'll keep going. David says, hello again from Alberta. What are your thoughts on outdoor living spaces? I'm looking at renovating my deck, looking to put in some sweat equity. Uh, outdoor spaces can be fantastic, especially for Airbnbs and for trying to drive up um, the income. People love a, a place to go out and, and have a, you know, have a, a place to, to sit by a campfire or to sit back and lounge, some lounge chairs. People love the outside, they love fresh air. So from a resale perspective, definitely having a little bit of outdoor space is good. I would say, depending on the property, like if it's an average house and an average subdivision, to be honest, like don't go crazy on the deck. If you spend $5,000 on a nice cute deck and a little patio, or you spend $50,000, it's going to have the same or a similar lift. Like you're not going to get that extra $45,000 you spend on the deck back when you sell. It's not a good use of money. So some things you do don't have a good ROI. And decks sometimes have a bad ROI. So just be careful. You do want to have some outdoor space. So if you, it depends on the property. If you have nothing back there, maybe not a great idea to have nothing. Maybe put a, a patio in. Fine, go on Facebook Marketplace, look for someone getting rid of 24 by 24 patio stones. There's tons of people posting that kind of stuff. Um, and go get them up, pick them up for free. Put those down in a 12 by 12 area and make a little fire pit or something. It's like, there you go. You made a little patio and you walk out your back door and there's something there and you can find some cheap, you know, Kijiji or marketplace furniture. And there you go, set up something that's nice outside and that would help you resell value. Uh, of course, if you make something really nice, people will appreciate it. They'll be like, oh wow, that's nice. It's like, um, you know, when you put a new roof on a property, like, oh, that's nice. I'm not gonna pay you more money for the house, but that's nice. Uh, that makes me more confident to wanna pay the price you're asking. It doesn't make me wanna pay more, but I'm more likely to wanna offer on the property. Whereas like paint, kitchens, baths, um, flooring, those are like really high ROI upgrades. Anything visual that you can really see can have a huge upgrade within the home specifically. But don't go too crazy. Um, don't over renovate beyond the comparables in your neighborhood. So uh, it can be good. Definitely if you want to put a deck on and you see there's some ROI there and the comparables are there for putting on really sweet outdoor decks, do it. Put some sweat equity in and unlock you know, a whole bunch of that value. Uh, hey, Mike, hope you're doing well. What are your thoughts on the new mayor? I have very little thoughts. I don't. Tr I try not to listen into politics locally because um, it just really doesn't affect me at all. But um, I guess her name's like Chow or something, the new the new mayor. I saw some post about it. I might have that wrong. But the mayor of Toronto is some very, very progressive um, mayor. So I guess she'd be pro like LGBTQ plus I2Q, whatever it is. Um, sorry if I'm butchering that. I know they've added so many acronyms to it. And I'm probably leaving a bunch out, but... Um, I just, that's awesome. Like cool, uh, great for the, for the progressives. I hear she wants to raise property taxes. That's not so great for real estate investors. Uh, real estate probably will go down under her, uh, her management. It sounds like her practices will lead to lower prices. Uh, it sounds like she's not pro business really. She's more like try when you try to help the little guy, it's great, but it isn't always when you try to, to squeeze someone into a peg that doesn't belong in that peg. Sometimes the result is you don't get the best outcome. I would rather see the best person for the job get the job rather than let's try to force this person into the job. And it's like, I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't really care to be honest, either way, you know, the mayor doesn't really affect things all that much, but um, yeah, it seems like the little that I know, uh, she's not going to be good for Toronto real estate, but I've never been a Toronto real estate guy anyway. so. Again, doesn't affect me at all. I I don't understand the math in Toronto behind real estate, to be honest. If I ever were to get a property in, in Toronto, I would maximize the value on it, renovate it, maximize that value and sell it. Sell it right off, cash out. That's what I would do. But again, I don't live in Toronto and 
I don't want to live in Toronto. Michael says, uh, what are you going to renovate at the cottage? I just I covered that at the start of the stream there about some of the things that I plan to do here. And I'll share with you guys more as I uh, get into it here. I may also, um, this property kind of calls for it. I may also build a two or three car garage uh, in the, to kind of create like this wraparound effect, more of this mansion lodge effect as well. Um, and have a little kind of, you know, storage above the garage. So that would give it a lot of curb appeal. It would really allow it to, to comp against four and five car garage type properties. It would elevate the value a lot. So I could spend a hundred grand, you know, building a really cool bougie garage in the front. And um, that would potentially give me a three or four X return on that. So I may get three, four hundred thousand dollars in lift. So that's one of the build things I might do here. But um, we'll see. I've been in talks with the conservation. They want me to stay just to the front of the property. So I can't really do anything in the back as far as building. D how to says greetings, greetings. Do you provide a washer dryer in your rentals? I try to always have a dishwasher and a washer dryer in my rentals. Again, I don't have very many rentals. The properties that I have currently in Canada are mostly to be flipped. I'm trying to sell off anything that's long-term rental because again, I don't want to have that um, landlord tenant board obligation, that residential tenancy act obligation. So when I have properties, I do have a couple like, you know, I might hold a property that my mom lives in. I might have a property that my dad lives in. I, I may, you know, I have a property that I live in. I have, you know, Airbnb rentals, short-term rental stuff, flip stuff. We do have a rental property in Sarnia that that does all right. Um, we rent the, the house for $3,000 a month plus utilities. We may sell that property, I don't know, for like $399,000. If I was looking, we may consider selling that property for three nine nine. So it, it brings in $36,000 a year in rent, plus the tenant pays all the utilities and has their own maintenance and lawn and everything. They just rent the whole house. It was supposed to be a duplex setup, but they just wanted the whole house for $3,000 a month. So that one's almost a 10 cap, single family, well, you know, decent property um, that my brother currently manages. So again, I've never even been to the property, but I funded it and I own it. So if you guys want uh, to buy that, hit me up. It's, again, I got three ninety dollars ish thousand. I mean, what do you want? Thirty-six thousand dollars a year in rent for three ninety? It's like almost ten x. Um, it's a pretty good multiple. So yeah, I do have a few little rentals, but I'm trying to get out of the rental business because again, like for me, a thousand dollars doesn't change my life at all. Like a thousand dollars a month means nothing to me. And like, let's say like a thousand dollars a month in profit on that property every month, and I've got like two hundred thousand, and I'd rather just take it out and like just redeploy that capital and go on to more flips. If I can keep that capital moving, keep the velocity on it, I can make, you know, tens of thousands on that money as opposed to making a thousand dollars a month. Just, uh, we could keep the property too. I'm, I'm indifferent on it. We're not losing money, we're making money, so. But yes, washers and dryers, definitely uh, wherever you can squeeze in a stackable in a closet, in the corner of the kitchen, wherever you can squeeze in a stackable washer or dryer to allow for laundry in the unit. You do have a garage in the back. If you can throw it in the shed of the garage so that the tenants have access to a shared laundry, adding laundry to a property is huge in increasing the tenant profile. Loser tenants are okay with no laundry. Good quality tenants want laundry in their unit or adjacent. So put laundry in. Good tenants also want dishwashers. So put that in. And you have a better quality tenant that will stay longer, will pay more in rent. So yes, 100% you should do that in either your rentals or your Airbnbs. I currently have a new tenant, but this particular property does not have a washer dryer. You definitely should, 100%. Put that in. Like button, hit the like button. Thank you, yes. Definitely do that. That'd be cool. Uh, do you have any books, courses, mastermind groups? Love your channel. You give out a lot of great information. So I like that washer dryer money. So in the topic of washers and dryers, there are some cool businesses you can do that are adjacent to real estate and that are, I used to own a, a laundromat actually. It's a, it's a cool business. The challenge I think with the laundromats that I had was I didn't have scale. So trying to get things fixed and, and deal with that was a pain because you need a specialist that understands how to fix those specific machines. And you got to have someone you can trust to go collect the cash unless you do it yourself, which wasn't something I was interested in. So managers often skim that business. So that's, I respect for that business. It's a great cash business too, which is like the government can't, can't lock you down and control you. You get the freedom. D how to says, uh, let me add, um, oh, sorry. To answer the last year question. No, I have no current books. No, I have no courses. I have nothing to sell you. Um, I do do the occasional coaching calls. So if you want to get on a call, I occasionally will book those like once a month, I'll book a call. So if you want to get on my wait list, the way to get on there is rosarcapital at gmail.com shoot me an email. And if you badger me, 
and I see your email pop up enough and I'm bored one time going for a drive to the cottage for an hour, I might pick up the call and say, hey, let's let's talk for an hour. Let's do let's do a coaching call. And so I've walked through people's, you know, life situations and their current businesses and given strategic advice and things like that. So happy to do that. I just haven't gotten around to making any courses. Coming soon. I continue to say coming soon. If I find the right um, set of situations and circumstances where I find myself motivated to want to sit down and build out a video course that I can sell to you guys, um, I'll do that. There's a lot up here I want to get out. But for now, get the free stuff every week. You know where to find me on here and on Instagram. I post daily on Instagram. All right. Brand new washer and garage. Just saying I nothing. Yeah, definitely. You should definitely have that. Joseph says, hey, just wanted to say thank you so much for all the info and content you provide. Hey, thanks. Appreciate that, Joseph. Uh, there is no one out there who is as transparent and motivating as you. You're an inspiration. Thank you so much. Appreciate that comment. That means a lot. I like to get those kind of comments. And they, they don't make my day. During low interest rate times, I get a place with a pool house. I rent both Airbnb, and when they're both rented, I stay in the RV next door. Glad to hear someone else is preaching house hacking the new way. There you go. So it's definitely, that's just like traditional house hacking right there. Which basically, you have a spare driveway, let's say, and it was doing nothing. It was a piece of land that you owned, and now you've driven on an RV, put an RV on that spot. Now, all of a sudden, if that's within zoning compliance and whatever, you can now live there, and you're using that land that was not being used before. And the rest of the house can be rented out and generate income. And so that, or you could just rent that RV out, go on RV Easy or one of the Airbnb sites for RVs. You rent that out for 50 bucks a night, probably. Boom. Now that piece of land, that dry, spare driveway you had beside your house, now it's generating you income. And so that's what house hacking is all about. At its core, it's about making things more efficient. And there are so many shittily run resorts out there that are not on the internet. They're not on Airbnb and like campgrounds I've seen that have like, I went to a campground once that had 50 sites or had a bunch of sites. And several of the sites were rented long-term to someone for $1,500 a year. Like the person had been there for like so many years and they just rented that site for $1,500 a year. That's $100 a month. I'm like, you know you can like do a little tiny renovation and rent this, this cabin. And it was like a three-bedroom cabin. This cabin for $100 a night, $3,000 a month. And you do it for $1,500 a year. And they're like, oh, I just don't want to be bothered with that. Like now I'm not interested in that, right? So like that's just something that... Um, you know, I don't know. That's just something that uh, makes no sense to me. Why there's so much inefficiency and not, things aren't optimized. Do you have to thank you? Appreciate the the positive vibes. Just uh, a little bit. Uh, bum, bum. House hacking only works in tax free appreciation because you lose so much on that payment opportunity cost, which people never factor in. Yeah, I mean the the it's a good point. Um, well, I mean, okay, so let's say you're house hacking. I was told this by an account once, and so I don't know if this is any value or not, but let's say your mortgage is $3,000 a month, and you rented out the basement or two bedrooms for $500 a month each, and you run in $1,000 a month. Your expenses are three, dollars $4,000 a month, and you're bringing in $1,000 a month. I was told you don't even have to claim that because the, the property is in such a loss that that income would create a tax loss for you. Because you could write off a large percentage of your housing expenses you otherwise wouldn't be able to write off. So your hydro, your internet, your water, your gas, your percentage of your mortgage, your insurance, all those, your maintenance, CapEx, all of that you can start writing off and you can create a tax loss. So I was told by some accountants that you don't even claim that. If you're not generating a lot of income in your house, uh, not enough to even to profit and you're losing money on this house that you're living in, uh, potentially don't claim it at all. But um, if you do claim it, there's this argument that if you're claiming it for, if you're renting it all the time, that um, you know you would lose some of that tax-free appreciation on sale, and so maybe um, I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, something to think about. If it's a large percentage of the house that you're renting out, like a triplex, and you're living in one third of the units, and maybe that your unit is is fifty percent of the property, then you fifty percent of the space would be tax-free. Fifty percent of the space you pay some tax on. So if you're going to do it, or how most people are doing it, I guess is probably running it under the radar to some extent. But in a resort, yes, if you're house hacking a resort, then, I mean, probably the way to do it is like, the way I would probably do it is I would not be a resident in Canada. So if I was not a resident in Canada anymore, there would be no primary residence exemption anyway, because again, I live in the Bahamas and I pay no tax. If I lived in the Bahamas, I would pay no tax. So the times that I would come to visit Canada, it wouldn't, I, if I stayed at this resort or I stayed somewhere else, it wouldn't matter because I have no primary residence exemption. I'm not, I'm an alien for tax purposes. 
And that means that I'm not, all my income I earn globally is not taxed in Canada. If you ever wanted to, you used to keep your passport, you come back and move to Canada and you start paying tax in Canada, start getting free healthcare again if you wanted. But the cost of healthcare at my tax bracket is way higher. Although right now, because of that short, I currently have a huge tax loss. So I can stay in Canada for a while now because I have a million dollar tax loss to use that first. So definitely. Seems to me a lot of the time house hacking only works when you factor in tax-free appreciation because you lose so much on the down payment opportunity cost, which people never factored in. Um, that was the question I just answered. So D how to, if you create the tiny house resort, would you implement your plumbing, showers, restroom, electricity? So ideally what you want to do to make this compliant is to find an existing campground or find an existing resort and make it better. Because if you found like an existing 70 slot campground, it would have hookups for sewer at every single campsite. It would have water, it would have electricity, um, it would have all those things. You might have to upgrade some electricity if you're bringing in better RVs or tiny houses. You're just modernizing what's there. That's a lot easier than trying to build one from scratch. So uh, ideally what I'm looking for is if someone knows of an existing campground or an existing resort with 10 or 20 cabins on it that is run down or not well marketed, that would be something I'd like to buy. And then if I want to add sites, I could add another septic bed and another, because septic is typically what you're dealing with out here. There's usually not sewers. If you have sewers, bonus. This has sewers and city water, but some of the sites don't. And if you don't, then you have to put in a, a septic system to deal with the waste and you'd have to tie off the water and tie off the power as well. Maybe bring in more power potentially. That would be something you have to discuss with your municipality to find out what would work um, for it to, to work. But physically speaking, if you had an existing one, you could just grandfather, that's ideal. It's a lot less of a battle than trying to add things to it. So, but a second investment property, blah, 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 duplex conversion. Some investors suggested to flip or burr it in bigger cities. Um, what are your thoughts? So, again, I have to look at each property, but for the most part, I would say flipping generates faster capital. Um, there's something to be said, though, in your first building, your, your, your nest egg to hold the property and refinance it and burr it. And the reason for that is that you don't pay any tax. So for a while, you could kick the can down the road. You could use all those deductions when you bought the property and you fixed it up to offset your day job income. So you have no tax from your day job because your rental properties you're buying are creating losses to offset. So in the first three to five years, you, you can work a job, make hundred grand a year and pay no tax for five years using real estate to shelter that income. And then when you do eventually sell, it's a capital gain. So it's half tax free anyway. So it's a great way to build wealth in the beginning of your journey. Um, so that's why I held initially until I reached a certain, I think it was like a million and a half, two million bucks. Then I started selling properties off because I waited till I reached a certain point to start selling things off. And that was just from a tax perspective. But yeah, definitely. Bum, 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 bum. Next question was, uh, flip as a single family equals very small profit margin. So you can definitely flip single families that have great profit margins. It just depends on the deal. If it doesn't have good profit margins, then might not be the right type of deal. There are single families that have good margins. It's just you have nowhere to find them. They're often not on MLS. Harriet says, I want to diversify into real estate, but I'm in Toronto. Most good deals here are cash flow neutral. And then you speculate on appreciation. Um, well, no, Harriet, you could still invest in real estate outside of Toronto. Like just because you don't have to invest in real estate exactly where you live. You go to like, you know, an hour outside of Toronto, two hours outside of Toronto, and you can find lots of stuff that has way better cap rates. So... Um, or you could go to a different city. As long as you have, like, if your business is run properly, you don't have to go to your properties ever. Um, if your systems are proper and your management's good and you have a good Rolodex of trades, you could go once a quarter, once a year, check on things. You don't have to go to the property ever. I had properties in London that I haven't gone to. I used to have properties that would go a year without even going to the property at all. So, yeah, I mean, that's the manager's job. And why do you want to be a manager? That's a low-value job. I would say that... Um, you know, ideally you want to elevate as an investor into the higher functions and the higher roles. And so you can definitely invest in real estate without, without having to buy in Toronto. You could pick other markets that are better. But yeah, Ontario is getting increasingly shittier. Um, London is increasingly shittier as well from a regulations perspective and, and whatnot. Bah, bah, bah. Next question was, are you selling long-term rentals and keeping short-term rentals? Uh, more like I would sell anything that doesn't make a lot of sense to keep in the portfolio from a cash flow perspective. But yes, generally, I don't want long-term rentals. Now, in Florida, I may consider long-term rentals, but I like the short-term rental for a number of reasons. One, I, I really like that 
in a short-term rental setup, your property is fully staged and ready for sale at any time. With a, a long-term rental, you don't have a lot of options. With a short-term rental, you can pivot on a dime, put your property for sale, and it's in its best staged condition. So you go from like the guest is left to the property being listed the next day. And you have nice Airbnb quality photos you can use from your Airbnb listing. You, it's just, with short-term rental, you have options. You can sell it whenever you want. You can bring an appraiser and refinance it whenever you want. When you have a long-term rental and you want to sell it, you got to kick the tenant out. You got to get, or if the tenant stays, you got to get it to clean Clean, clean it all up and you've got to, you're walking behind the tenant. When people live in a property long-term, they do a lot more damage to the property too. And short-term rental, you know, you got your cleaners going in every couple, every week potentially between stays. And so things last longer because they're cleaned better. And if there is damage, you have a credit card on file. Boom, go for damages. If they decline it, you go to Airbnb. Boom, go for Airbnb cover. And you get the, the, the money back. Boom, done. In a long-term rental, you get nothing back. They leave and they're like, screw you, man. Like, I'm, I'm done, it's clean. And you walk in and it's like garbage bags everywhere. And you're like, oh, great, I have no recourse. So I like that in short-term rental, there's recourse and it's a business. People are there and they understand that you're running a business. In long-term rental, that line's blurred. Even in like Texas and Florida, I like the short-term strategy better because you're in better control of providing housing. You could provide longer-term housing through Airbnb. Like you could do a three-week stays at a time or whatever. I like it better. I like having credit card on file. I like that arrangement better. Um, it's just better control in general. So I like short-term rentals better. It's a different business model, but I just, I like it better. Now, in terms of, you know, whether I, I would flip or hold, it just depends. For me, I like flipping. The only properties I really want to be holding are things that make a lot of sense from economies of scale perspective. So a resort's nice because I can, I can partner with someone or I can bring a, a full staff in. I can have a maintenance guy full-time that's there if it's big enough. I can have a full-time manager that's there and that's their job. They're focused solely on not running well. And I can have a weekly meeting with them. We can look at data. I can give them strategic oversight and valuation of how to improve this. That's a lot of conversation I enjoy having. I don't enjoy talking to my property manager about like a leaking toilet. Like, no. I mean, the smaller stuff, you're dealing with a lot more of that and a lot less of the optimization. So I want to get to a scale and the resort allows you to have that where potentially there's even like an office, you know, COO that can manage all four resorts at a high level. And that's what I would like to get to that point. Um, a lot, I would like to do a lot less flipping and a lot more of that, but um, it's just a pivot. It's just a shift in what I'm currently doing. I would have to allocate, you know, some of my stock capital to that. And I plan to do that because again, the stock investing has not been going well. I, I've, I was doing very well until I started charting this year. And, um, you know, again, I went two to one. So the NASDAQ went up 40%, 39%, and I was two to one that. So thankfully, I traded my way with Theta Decay out of that. But I should be minus 80% on my portfolio. Eight, minus 80% wipes you out. I'm down like maybe 40%, but like brutal. Maybe the NASDAQ pulls back. It makes no sense to me. But uh, as the famous you know, Warren Buffett quote is, that uh, you know, they can be, the market can be irrational longer than you can be solvent. And you should never short. In general, you should just never short... Um, no matter how crazy it is, right? What do you think of the new mayor? I already answered those questions. I gotta go. My kids are all in here and it makes it harder to do the stream. So I'm gonna let you guys go. Um, hey, Idea Bank, thanks for saying hi. Uh, Afghan says, hey, brother, knowing what you know, would you do cash flow in real estate in London, Airbnb given you live in it, student rental? Uh, so what I would probably do is if I was starting fresh and I had to invest in London, uh, Airbnb, I would do student rental because Airbnb is technically banned. I would do Airbnb, but it's banned in London. So uh, I would do, I would do student rentals because again, students transition every year. So you get to keep up with market rents. Um, and yeah, so. Dihatu says, isn't keeping your money in real estate better for taxes in the U S no, not necessarily. Um, Canada is actually better from a tax perspective than the U S on a lot of things. So especially in real estate, like it depends on the state, but in some cases, the U.S. is actually worse for taxes overall. Use your real estate as a bank if you have enough equity. Um, no, you know, like you really, you really can flow everything back to the Bahamas. So I mean, it's, it's a non-issue. You could invoice your U.S. company for management, set up a management company, and hire people out of the Bahamas, and they could manage your properties virtually, hire like virtual assistants, and you could bleed back a lot of the profit to an operating company in the Bahamas, which has a one percent tax rate. So you can easily access the money whenever you want just by invoicing it um, there and, and paying some, a little bit of tax. 
but 1% tax is effectively nothing. So, yeah. Minus 80%. Yeah, definitely. Minus 80% sucks. I'm down like 40%. Um, again, because I hedged throughout that time, I, I would put on hedges that were long and I would close out and make a profit. So some the trading actually, like in, this year, the trading actually saved me. The active trading I was doing was actually adding to my net gain because if, you, if I didn't trade, if I just put the two times short on and didn't touch my portfolio at all, I'd be down 80% right now. Again, because I took a short position, so I, I bet against the NASDAQ, which like historically is not a good plan for the long term, but short term recessions, actually there's good data to support shorting and it tends to do better. But um, again, just my thesis when I put it on, I was actually long in January and then February I put it on. And my thesis was that we'd had a 10% run up and I was like, wow, it's a 10% run up is too fast, too soon. And I looked and the market was pricing in uh, rate cuts by July uh, rate, no, no more hikes, rate cuts going, like rates going down, inflation back to two and a half percent and everything back to normal by 2024 January. And I was like, that is not going to happen. Somehow though, the market's repriced that rates are going to stay high until 2025, but the market's gone up 40%. I'm like, wait, so shit's going to be worse than we thought. The economy is not going to be good. Inflation is sticky, core shit. Um, it, you know, inflation's way up, but market's still rallying. And so that like, it makes no sense to me. And so I've realized that there is no logic sometimes when you're talking about an AI bubble, talking about tech. So I will continue to risk manage that position to make sure that it doesn't become a contagion to the rest of my portfolio. Um, but yeah, it's shitty. It's really shitty. And um, I may, if, if I, if we don't see a pullback in the next three, four months, I'm going to probably cut the position. By the end of this year, if we don't see any pullback and I don't see any, you know, major downward trajectory on the NASDAQ, I'm probably going to cut that position, accept that loss and move on and just work in real estate. Like I can make a million dollars back in a year. So it's like, whatever, um, you know, in business, you're going to have some failures as well as some successes. So this will go down as probably my biggest failure so far to date, but uh, that's okay. I'm trying to stay positive about it and um, being negative about it. You learn from it, you move on. Take the lessons here on risk management. Take the lessons here on trying to time the market. None of us can time the market, not even Warren Buffett. There's a reason Warren Buffett never takes a short position, even on garbage. He's like the companies, hundreds of companies, where he's like, this is garbage, it will go to zero. But he doesn't have the conviction to short against idiots because there is a rational, stupid money out there. I've seen that in real estate too, like two cap rate properties. Again, it makes no sense. But um, sometimes the market's irrational and stupid people will bid the price to... Who knows when? And so trying to predict the price, can't do it. That's why I stick to businesses, stick to things I can control, stick to valuations, again, that I can control. Whereas in the stock market, you can't. So I hope I can see this short through. I hope that we'll get some chances to, to cover this short and close it out. So I'm waiting for those down days on the NASDAQ and hopefully I get those. And yeah, anyway, thank you everyone for watching. Secret to unlocking a lot through you. Three levers, control your financial future, spend less, earn more, and maximize returns in the difference. See you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh. Just beautiful. Look at that lake. I'll leave you guys with that for today. Nice little fire pit there. Just unreal. Anyway, we'll see you guys uh, next week.